Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome. Uh, this, we actually had uh, what Jim and I would probably be looking for in the stock market happen to our connection here, which is it crashed. Uh, too many people actually queued in. So again, thank you very, very much for doing this. It's actually the first time we've ever gone live. So again, not a huge conceptual surprise that between Jim and I, we might have an audience that's uh, a little bigger than it is small. So again, thank you for your patience. Apologies, big time apologies for that. Uh, so let's just kind of get on with it. I'm very happy to have Jim here to go through uh, what I think is a very interesting title. Jim, you called it the new case. You know, you, right. you know people call it whatever they want to call it. I mean, I, th I was actually surprised that you called it the new case because you're so well versed in what, what's been the ongoing case. So first, I just want to welcome you. And, and again, you. Uh, on behalf of both of us, apologize to everybody that we're a little late here. But um, maybe just use that as a, for, like, why did you write that that way? Um, sure. And, and uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. And again, uh, uh, thank the audience for, for hanging in there through a little technical glitch. The, the title actually, the, the new case for gold, the title of the book, actually has an interesting history. This goes back to, um, of course, from 1933 to 1975, it was illegal for Americans to own gold. It was like drugs or you know, any, any other kind of contraband. Finally, in 1975, the Ford administration repealed that so Americans could own gold. So in 1980, when Ronald Reagan ran for president, and it wasn't that long that we had been off the gold standard. It was 71, so we were only talking nine years later. Uh, there was a lot of momentum in the Reagan conservative camp to go back to the gold standard. So what, the, what Reagan did as a candidate, he does what politicians always do. He said, well, we'll have a commission to study it. You know, you didn't want to come down <laughs> and study it. So they did appoint a gold commission in, in 1981, and with some prominent Americans on both sides. They studied it. They came back. They recommended that we not go back to the gold standard. However, the commission was divided, and as is often the case, the minority was allowed to file a minority report. Now, the minority was Lou Lehrman, Ron Paul, you know, some very interesting gold advocates. So they filed a minority report to this gold commission saying we should go back on the gold standard. Well, this is a public record. So uh, some publisher, an enterprising publisher, took the minority report and published it as a book called The Case for Gold. Mm -hmm. And it was like an underground bestseller in the early 80s. The old gold bugs all, all remember it very well. So when it came time to write this book, I were working with my publisher, they said, well, let's kind of hark back to that and mm -hmm. call it The New Case for Gold. So that's actually where the title came from, but it plays a little bit off this, The Case for Gold, which was the minority report from the 1981 Gold Commission. That's interesting. Um, so there's a little bit of history there, but just to kind of emphasize the word new a little bit, there are arguments for and against gold or having gold in your portfolio as an allocation and so forth. And we'll, we'll talk about those, I hope. But, um, but there are new arguments in favor of gold that are 21st century arguments yeah, that simply exactly. were not part of the debate in the 1980s and the 1990s. And, and first and foremost is the fact, you know, uh, we're here in, uh, uh, in Stanford, Connecticut, and we're surrounded by all these uh, you know, hedge fund billionaires <laughs> in Grand Age. You know some, I know some. So you talk to these billionaires and they go, oh, I'm, I'm rich, whatever. I'm really, what do you have? Like, I got stocks, bonds, all this stuff. I said, no, you don't. You have electrons. This is all digital wealth. Uh, you, get a, you get reports you know, from your broker, yeah. probably online, you, know, you pay your bills online, you get paid online, et cetera. This is digital wealth. Vladimir Putin has a 6,000 member cyber brigade working 24 hours a day to hack and disrupt and erase the financial system of the United States. Now, he, I'm not saying he's going to do it tomorrow morning, and there's a deterrent aspect to it. You know, it's like, it's like a mutual short destruction. <laughs> I call it mutual short financial destruction. But if you have digital wealth and you wake up one day and it's all gone, don't be surprised. That's my only point. So you need some tangible wealth. That obviously gold, I would say number one. It's not the only tangible asset. It's silver, land, real estate, fine art. There's a list of, uh, of tangible wealth, and not all in. You know, I kind of recommend 10% gold. But, but that threat. We weren't talking about cyber financial warfare in 1985 or 1995, no, or maybe even not in 2005. Yeah. But we are today. So there are there are new arguments. Uh, to put on the table side by side with all the old arguments that we're all uh, familiar with. Well, it's interesting. I mean, if you go way back, old, 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 I mean, we can go there, and, and you have actually in your book, which I'll, we'll eventually get to, we'll probably do another segment on that, because really, to me, this is, an, and I think you, you call this your manifesto, or at least some you yeah. know, really deep history of gold from your perspective. And I think that when people think about you, the currency war, they'd expect this of you. So it was really interesting and certainly exciting for me to see that just pop onto my screen. Oh, you know, he finally wrote a book, and it actually looks like a gold bar. This is, this is fantastic. <laughs> It's a solid gold cover, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if you get into the more modern debate, I mm -hmm. think you did a really good job basically highlighting who people would acknowledge as thoughtful, intellectual, in some cases we both probably call ideologues, um, you know, Milton Friedman, mm -hmm. Rubini, 
I mean, you have a lot of names. We're going to you know, pop some pictures up here because you went in the first page of the book, you went like I like it, right to the wood. You went right after them and you also highlighted not just the old anti-gold crew, mm -hmm. which are Nobel laureates, by yep, the way, sure. but the new gold crew, like right. the, the anti-gold crew, which are, are people that are more Gen X or my age, I would say, yep. people that are in the media mm -hmm. that may not be, well, first of all, they're not, you know, in some cases, brokers or bloggers or journalists. Yep. They have no academic standing. They have nothing that you could actually even compliment. So I wonder how you think about that, because there's two completely different classes that completely disagree with us. Well, you, you put your finger on the key issue, Keith. This book is primarily educational. I think m my publisher suggested it's a manifesto. I think, I think it is a manifesto. It's a manifesto to own some gold. Right. I'll have gold in your portfolio. But that has to be educational. Um, and uh, there, is, there is the older generation and the younger generation. So I just take, you know, th my problem with, with, with uh, Gen X and some of the millennials, I was actually the last class to study gold in a monetary context. Uh, I, I got a graduate degree in international economics uh, in 1974, and that was right at the very tail end of the gold standard. Everyone says it ended in 71 when Nixon went off gold. Not quite. Gold was still a monetary asset for several more years. Right. Took the IMF a few years to actually demonetize mm -hmm. it. So I learned gold as a, you, know, you, you looked at balance sheets, uh, 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 national payments accounts, national accounts, and gold was a monetary asset. It was part of what you had to pay to join the IMF back in the day. The original SDR was gold backed, et cetera. Right. So I studied as a monetary asset. If you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you either went to mining college or you're self-taught because they simply stopped teaching it. So now you have this Gen, you know, Gen X, millennials, and, and perfectly bright, great schools, great degrees, high IQs, who know nothing about gold. They, it's simply, they stop teaching it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a, a, a lost art, so mm -hmm. to speak. But they think they know about gold. What they think they know <laughs> are six or seven, I call them robot responses, cliches. So I had a lot to say in favor of gold, but when I wrote the book, I said, all right, before I get to all that, I need to demolish these arguments because I'm tired of hearing them. And it was a little bit, <laughs> It was a little bit of a rant, but you know, you, you go on television, you you go to conferences, you you know, you encounter you know the folks you're talking about, particularly the you know the younger journalists, and they'll, they'll just hammer you. You know, it's like there's not enough gold in the world to support world trade. It's not true. Uh, gold has no yield. It's not supposed to. It's money. You know, pull a dollar bill out of your wallet and look at it really hard. Does it have a yield? No, it ha doesn't have a what yield. What if you look harder? No, you stare all you want at the dollar bill or the $20 bill or the $100 bill, if you can find one. Uh, it, it doesn't have any yield. It's not supposed to have yield. It's money. People go, oh, I can stick it in the bank and get a yield. Well, yes, you can. But now it's not money anymore. Like the Fed would like you to think it's money because they're in that, the game of propping yeah. up that particular illusion. But you're an unsecured creditor of a, of a bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, just talk to the people in Cyprus and Greece and elsewhere around the world about money in the bank. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't have money in the bank. I'm saying understand that it's not risk free. To get any yield, you have to take some risk. So a paper dollar and a gold coin are both forms of money. Bitcoin is a form of money. Mm -hmm. None of them, not one of them has yield. They do not have yield. They're not supposed to. They're units of account, mediums of exchange, store of wealth. If you want yield, you have to take risk. So, so when you say gold has no yield, I'm like, I'm like, of course it doesn't have yield. It's not supposed to. All the other arguments, that, that's the only one that's true but irrelevant for the reason I mentioned. All the other arguments just fall down. Well, that, I mean, a lot of those arguments are born out of Wall Street arguments for what they own and get paid by. You know, Correct. If you're being interviewed by a journalist on a modern day, you know, old wall TV channel, yep. you know, your, 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 your content is old wall research, right. old Wall Street buy siders or, you know, or both, and they're basically pushing not being long gold because they want to be long uh, something that has a dividend yield or right. something that has what they're used to seeing in an up market, by the way, not in a down market, right. which, uh, of course, we can talk about. Here's the thing. I understand why sell-side analysts disparage gold because they're in the business of selling something other than gold. I understand why academic economists disparage gold because they want to run the world with paper money. I right. get that. I don't Actually, I've heard lately that they want to get rid of that, too. Well, they do. They want to, they want to have it completely digital so Vladimir Putin can wipe it out. What I don't understand is why um, buy-side investors and journalists don't work harder to understand gold, why they, right. why they buy into the propaganda. That's that's actually why I wrote. No, the book. I, that's and, and thank you for that because for somebody like me, I mean, I'm a history student to a fault. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's a, a major mistake in my life, but the reality mm -hmm. is that it is uh, underwhelming. Would be a very, I, I think, uh, unaggressive word to describe the journalistic knowledge, uh, certainly of economic history and how, and how it relates to gold. 
and or money. I mean, they just don't understand. They've yeah. not studied it. They're not interested in it. They're almost more in, in, interested in inciting, uh, or at least insinuating, that you're a bad guy, yeah. uh, oh. or that we're like uh, dumb people. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it is. Well, you get used to that very quickly. If you have a kind word to say for gold, um, you're, uh, uh, you're a Neanderthal, you're a throwback, you're a gold bug, you're a gold... <laughs> I'm used to that. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm past that. But as I say, you have to... It's one thing to make the case for gold, which I do, but you have to kind of knock down these arguments. Let's just take one. Uh, you know, my friend uh, Joe Weisenthal uh, was on with him. He refers to gold as a pile of rocks. I was like, sorry, Joe, it's a metal. You know, it's not rocks. So let's start there. But they'll, they'll say things, for example, that gold is a barbarous rock. John Maynard Keynes said gold is a barbarous rock. He actually never said that. What, I, I tracked down the quote. I bought a, an out-of-print 1924 edition of uh, Keynes' monetary theory, yeah. which, which I have. Um, what I have that too. But his reference to uh, Barbara Strelk, he said the gold exchange standard of the 1920s is already right. a Barbara Strelk. He wasn't talking about gold, he was talking about the monetary architecture, and he was right. The that, standard. That, that, that was a completely flawed standard. Uh, in 1914, on the brink of World War I, the Exchequer and uh, His Majesty's Treasury wanted to uh, go off the gold standard. Germany, France, at the, at the outbreak of World War I, Germany, France, Belgium, all the combatants had abandoned gold. They said, we're going to keep the gold because we need to fight yep. the war. Uh, the UK wants to do that also. Keynes was the loudest, most persuasive argument for staying on the gold standard. <laughs> and he said, uh, money is finite, but credit is elastic. If we stay on the gold standard, we will have credit. We can borrow the money we need to fight the war. The House of Morgan in New York organized billions of dollars of loans for the UK, no loans for Germany, UK mm -hmm. won the war. So Keynes was exactly right. In 1925, Winston Churchill, bl believe it or not, was Chancellor of the Exchequer before, well, yep. before he became Prime Minister. And the issue then was going back to the pre-World War I gold standard. And Keynes said, look, if you go, he, Keynes didn't favor the gold standard at that time, but he said, if you do it, make sure you get the price right. Churchill was insisting on the pre-World War I price. Keynes said, no, you've doubled the money supply to fight the war. If you want parity, you only have two choices. You have to double the price of gold, and that was go back over the different parity, or cut the money supply in half. He said, yep. this is deflationary. Churchill selected the pre-World War I parity, the lower price, in other words. They did reduce the money supply. The UK went into a recession. But that was not the problem with gold. That was the problem with flawed monetary policy and a bad decision by Winston Churchill. If he had listened to Keynes, mm -hmm. he would have got that right. And then finally, in 1944, just before he died, uh, Keynes at Bretton Woods uh, recommended the bank corps, the kind of predecessor of the SDR, the special drawing mm -hmm. right, which would be commodity backed, including gold. It was not a pure gold standard, but it included gold. So at the beginning of his career, he was pro gold. At the end of his career, he was pro gold. In the middle of his career, he gave good advice on gold, even though he wasn't advocating <laughs> it. So it's a much more nuanced view. So when you say Barbara Strelick, to me, you're just, you're repeating a cliche. You've heard it before. You don't really know what it means. You haven't done the research. And I just go one by one, and every one of these anti-gold arguments, well, a lot they're, of it, they're all a, red a lot of it, too, is they're pro-monetary policy. So right. somebody like Zervos and a guy like Joey would get along, you know, because right. they're just purveying the same ideology that the central planner can bend in smooth economic gravity, sure. and they don't believe in gold. That, that right. They would never believe in a free market price on something like that. That would be you know, disastrous to how they wake up in the morning. Right. But that said, you, might, you have guys like me. Okay, guys like me, I think I'm well-versed in history. I'm you know, not no. the world's best historian. But I'm indifferent. Uh, I, can own, I own gold between 2003 and 2012. I didn't mm -hmm. sell the top. On the way down, I just said to myself, like a Giffen good, people will chase price. And this mm -hmm. is the, kind of the point that I want to get into with you, which is, what if you're like me? You understand it. A down dollar, if you devalue the dollar and interest rates are falling because growth is slowing, those are the most you know, impressive modern periods of gold outperformance. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to be long. Right. Like this year, that's why I'm long gold again. Mm -hmm. As soon as I saw that start to develop, the dollars start to drop, interest rates start to go to negative in many cases, and U.S. rates fall you know, to new lows. Mm -hmm. To me, which you and I have had that view for a long time, right. it's like, bingo, we finally got, we got rid of that strong dollar, at least in, in acceleration terms, mm -hmm. I'm good to go. Yep. So what do you say to people like me that don't like I don't go to bed with gold. I don't. I have a one wife. I have four ch yep, children. I'm I not like. Either, right. I, I'm not wed to to that. Um, like, what do you say? Do you even need to say anything to me? 
look, I think you, I think you do need to make the case for gold. Look, I, uh, I'm not some. Uh, I haven't spent the last 30 years sitting in my basement counting gold coins. I, <laughs> no, I do. I do you own. Just, you just educated. I, I do. I do own gold. I started buying it around 700. I stopped buying it around uh, 1375. I think was the most I ever paid. Well, that that last leg up from about 1450 to 1900, you could see it was a spike. It was yeah. it was just feeding on itself. It was good. I, I expect gold to go to ten thousand dollars an ounce for reasons we can talk about, but it, yeah. I, I didn't think it was going to happen in two, two, 2011. That was clearly a spike. It backed up. Now, look, if you bought it at 1900 in 2011 and you sold it at 1050 in uh, November 2015, you lost 45 percent. Mm -hmm. But I don't know anyone who chased it up, and if uh, you started buying at lower levels, and actually right now, I think we're at a very good um, good entry point. But but the answer is, look, once you kind of grasp the concept that gold is money, you're competing with other currencies: yes. the euro, the dollar, the yen. So great way to think about it. And then people talk about. When they say gold's up, gold's down, I'm like, no, an ounce of gold, atomic number 79, it's an element, you know, if you have some gold <laughs> and you wait two years and you don't do anything and you come back, you've got the same amount of gold. It didn't go up or down. What changed is the dollar price. But gold dollar yes. is a cross rate. It's no different than the EUR slash USD. Exactly. It's no reason, no different than the euro dollar cross rate, the yen dollar right. cross rate. Gold dollar is a cross rate. And so saying gold went up, all you really said is, the dollar went down right. relative to gold, or if gold went down, that means the dollar went up. And so, if you want to understand gold in dollar space, mm -hmm. I, I like to think of gold in in weight, mm -hmm. in a physical weight of gold. But if you want to understand gold in dollar space, then just ask yourself: Is the dollar going to get weaker or stronger? Well, right. it's so strong right now; it's killing the U.S. economy, it's killing exports, it's killing corporate earnings because the overseas earnings have to be translated into fewer dollars because of mm -hmm. the strong dollar. Um, you know, the Fed might raise rates. I expect they will raise rates in June. That might give the dollar one last push. But the dollar has to come down mm -hmm. or we're going to kill the economy. And that's very bullish for gold. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take that and you, you overlay the cycle, and I think this is where the, and again, I don't expect a, a glorify, you know, glorified broker or a journalist to figure this out. That's not their job. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to depend on their opinion. What I'm really interested in is how gold got caught in the Federal Reserve's money printing and the creation of the commodity bubble. Right. How do I separate the cycle or the epic commodity bubble that we had with things that aren't elements, you know, like weeds? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a much more appropriate, I would say, to call wheat a weed than it is to call gold a bag of rocks. Right. You know, how do we? How do you think about that relative to where we've come from in the last 16 years, maybe? Well, it's a really good question. I wrote a column on this recently. I, I said that gold is a chameleon. Uh, we all know if you put a chameleon on a green leaf, it looks green. You put it on a brown tree trunk, it looks brown. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, so gold uh, sometimes trades like a commodity. Right. Sometimes trades like an investment. It competes with stocks and bonds for investor portfolios. And sometimes it acts like money. Now, I think of it as money. I think that's the right way to mm -hmm. think about it. But look, it trades on commodity exchanges and you know, sell side debates it all, you know, all day Major long. component of every single commodity index, Correct. every single equity chart chasers components of commodity as an exposure. Right. It got wrapped into one mother of a bubble, man. Right. So have a look at the uh, continuous commodity index in late 1994, right around, uh, sorry, 2014, right around uh, November 2014. So here's the commodity index, here's gold, very high correlation. They're tracking, mm -hmm. you would expect that gold's, gold's in the index. So you would expect a decent correlation between gold and the index. All of a sudden, November 2014, they separate. Gold goes like this, the yes. index goes like that. Now, the index went down because of oil and, uh, you know, the Chinese slowed down, a lot of things we understand. Why didn't gold go down, too? When I saw that breakout, I said to myself, aha, the chameleon has changed. Mm -hmm. Now it's money. It's competing in money space. But, but me, I would say the chameleon is also interest rates. Yeah. There was a point yeah. in 2014, as you know, where interest rates, no matter what they threatened on a go forward basis on a rate hike or a prospective series of rate hikes, rates just wouldn't go up. Right. You know, and that's when gold stopped going down too. Yeah. I mean, so there is that link to, um, you know, people can have a pretty deep debate about who sets the price of money via interest rates. So if you're arguing that gold is money, mm -hmm. yeah, and then Which interest rates are a very important component of calculating the value of money. A absolutely. Then isn't that like uh, one of the new, for me, that's the, it's, it's, it's not the new case, it's the way that I've always thought about it. Gold. It's one of the fundamentals. When we talk about interest rates, we're generally talking about the, the dollar interest rate. So if, the do if dollar and gold are competing forms, and they are, uh, they are and interest rates are going up and down, and the dollar is going to affect the dollar price of gold. There's, there's, there's a very simple uh, reciprocity there. Now, what's interesting, we talked about how gold has no yield because it's money. Yep. But in a world of 
negative yields, which we see in ECB, Japan, Sweden, Switzerland, and elsewhere, gold is a high yield asset. Mm -hmm. uh, zero is more than negative 40 basis points last time I checked. Right. So actually gold, <laughs> gold on a relative basis yes. is, is a so high So it, it really does, high negative yield yields asset. really right. are the catalyst for gold. Part of it, yes. Of it. I agree with that. But the, other, but the other catalyst, I think probably even more important, is are real rates. So don't just look at, you know, don't just look at nominal rates, look at real rates. Right. And the problem right now is that real rates are still fairly high. Now, I think Wall Street looks at, uh, um, you know, LIBOR versus inflation. I look at the 10 year note versus inflation because mm -hmm. nobody, nobody finances their house at LIBOR. Nobody, no, 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 Exxon doesn't spend $5 billion on an infrastructure project at LIBOR. I mean, maybe they can swap it out, but they basically think of those long term rates. And so that's the comparison I do. Real rates, even with the 10 year note at you know, yield to maturity 1.9%, with inflation, you know, who knows, uh, maybe 1.5 or whatever, real rates are still positive, mm -hmm. which is bad for gold. So I'm, impressed that gold has done as well as it has in a positive real rate environment. That's an interesting when, when they finally get, when, when the market takes those nominal rates lower or inflation ticks up, and by the way, I, I don't have a, uh, inflation is going to get higher eventually. It has to, it, not right away, but the Fed will not rest until they get the inflation they want. So I think we, we have to take that as a given. Governments cannot tolerate deflation. It is their worst nightmare. Destroys tax collections. You know, increases real uh, debt to GDP because the real value of debt goes up. Uh, that's happening now. Even when budget deficits weigh down, and they have, they've come from 1.4 trillion. Perpetuates to credit about 400 cycles. Billion. You know, uh, the ECB is buying corporate bonds because they don't want to have credit risk in the marketplace. I mean, correct. Everything. Right. I mean, so, so they have to, they have to get inflation going up. So you say, well, gee, what good does it do if you get inflation up to two and a half? You know, Charlie Evans would say three would be nice. <laughs> uh, he said that to me. But, but even if you get inflation to three, three and a half, what good does that do you if the ten-year note goes to five? Because you still have these positive real rates. Well, this is where financial repression comes in. When yes. they get the inflation up, they're going to use financial repression to keep a lid, say, on the 10-year note, keep that below the rate of inflation, get negative real rates. They have to do that yes. to, to, to make the debt go away. It's like an ice cube in your hand. The debt's just going to melt you know, in real terms. When you see that, gold's going to scream. And that's what happened in the late yeah. 1970s. And that's what the Fed's trying to engineer now is, as uh, Sir Mick says, uh, you know, you can't always get what you want. I mean, just because the Fed wants inflation doesn't mean it happens overnight. But they're not going to rest until they get it. When they do, they're going to keep a lid on nominal rates. You're going to have negative real rates. That is the best possible environment for, for the dollar price of gold. Yeah, that we agree 100 percent on. And, and by the way, most importantly, so does the market. Yep. You know, Mr. Market is the best economist that I know. And in, in delineating what's going on in the market this year, I mean, people are just whining about how much, well, the stock market's not down that much. I mean, get over yourself. Right. If you're long what you like, which is the long bond or gold, you're not down. You don't have to make excuses. You don't have to whine. It's actually always had a place, as you'd say, in your portfolio because it does have that feature. Right. There's some, again, there's some asymmetry in your portfolio and your stocks are going down. Mm -hmm. In this case, gold's going up. So that's the last thing. And we have a bunch of questions here that I have coming in here sure. on this nice iPad um, that the, the, the animal spirit component or I call it, it's a Giffen good like I mm -hmm. said people like housing is a Giffen good people chase price when the price goes up investment managers take notice they're like I'm not long these charts I have to start chasing it I'm underweighted you know the, this component of gold has always been a major component of gold mm -hmm. uh, we have one chart that shows um, you know, the question is actually I told my analyst it's the wrong question because the question that he asked was, what happens if investors stop buying gold? But investors have stopped buying gold, is right. what I told them. I mean, gold's gone down to, you know, to, since 2011 from its sure. peak. Right. If you're long it as a, and, and the reality is in our business, everybody has got weekly at this point, monthly pressures to pr print performance. You couldn't have stayed with it. So my question was more turning it over and saying, of the 23% of gold demand that is investors, what if they really do start to demand it again? Well, and that 23% of investors, a lot of that are, are individual investors. Um, now, I talk to institutions all the time, as, as do you. Um, I was just in Switzerland last week, actually visited with the uh, head of the world's largest uh, gold refinery. I can't disclose his name, but I call him Goldfinger. He's a, he's a friend of mine. That's my, but he's not a villain. He sounds he's, like a friend you'd have. He's, he's, one of the, he's one of the good guys. He actually uh, presented me with a very nice, I gave him a copy of my book. It's, not, uh, it's out as soon, but I had an advanced copy. Uh, and he gave me the, the nicest present. He said, uh, Jim, this is my Swiss survival kit. And it was a, um, a, it was a Swiss Army knife with a one gram gold bar, 24 karat gold bar, embedded in the handle of the oh, knife. Oh, cool. Yeah, so he said, you know, you can either fight your way out or buy your way out, you know. So uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was interesting getting that uh, on the plane. But, uh, so, um, but, but I learned a lot about, you know, you see, gold is a gift and good. It is, 
in paper space, meaning COMEX, unallocated gold futures, yep. options. On the physical space, it behaves more like a normal good. I talk to gold dealers around the world. They say, like when, jewelry. Yeah, you know, when they say the price Which, goes down to 1050, they say people are lined up around the block. Right. Yeah, you know, they, they, they want all they can. And that's so, a critical point. Like, if our team can trade, show that yeah. chart, I mean, jewelry is 55%. Right. Uh, industrial demand is 10, uh, official purchases are 12. But in the physical space, you're quite correct. That's always been true. Right. Now, we're not going to have a world of, you know, physical gold is not going to be 3,000 and COMEX gold is, is, you know, 1,500. That's not going to happen because of the arbitrage. Yeah. But the, the question is, which dominates in the short run? And, and actually, yes. the paper gold trading tends to dominate. So it's, a, it's an occasional gift to people who want to buy physical gold. Right. Like, hey, if China wants to suppress the price because they need to buy 3,000 tons, which is a lot of gold, 10% of all the official gold in the world, I'll take the I'll take the 1050 entry point or 1100 entry point. Thank you very much. So there, there, it's just a it's just a crazy market between the paper and the physical. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, I think I think we put our uh, our finger on the fundamentals. But I mean, just coming back to uh, you know the, uh, the you know the gold bashers that never rest. Uh, <laughs> and um, you know, one of the other arguments they say is, well, you you can never have a gold standard because there's not enough gold to support world trade and finance. Look at the size of world trade and finance. Look at the gold supply. Multiply by you know twelve hundred dollars an ounce is clearly not enough gold. That's nonsense. There's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. Now, if you multiply at twelve hundred dollars, yes, there's not yeah. enough gold. If you multiply at ten thousand dollars, there's plenty of gold. So the <laughs> point is, the point is, I'm not saying you'll have a gold standard tomorrow, but the point is, if you do have a gold standard, you cannot repeat the blunder of Winston Churchill of 1925. And economists understand mm -hmm. this. You have to pick. A, you have to pick. So, what's the implied non-deflationary price mm -hmm. of gold? under a gold standard, given the money supply, and given world trade? The answer is $10,000. It's eighth grade math. I mean, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not that complicated. Just, just divide and make well, a couple you know, of What is complicated, Jim, is that people still adhere to a linear view of supply and demand economic models. Mm -hmm. and to me, that's shocking. Yeah. It's equally as shocking as people not understanding the history of money, the history of gold. Right. It's kind of sad. Right. You know, like we've gone through two major I, I argue economic crises in the last 15 years, mm -hmm. and I think we're going into the next one. Yeah, and people right. are general. I'm talking the consensus. Uh, we may have a lot of people following us right now. They're not. They are not the majority. Right. And they're not the silent minority. By the way, we, our our followers are quite loud uh, on both sides of mm -hmm. the coin. But people really, and and genuinely, think in supply and demand linear space. Most arguments. I, I find that, that that's the case against almost everything that I believe. Right. Well, yeah, these are they're, they're linear uh, models, they're equilibrium models. Uh, even if they're using uh, um, some nonlinear math, it's still in the context of, of an equilibrium model. The world is not an equilibrium system, right. it's a complex system. <laughs> I've said many times if you have the wrong model, you'll get the wrong result exactly. every time. Um, and another one of these. Uh, uh, canards you hear is you know, gold caused the Great Depression. We can't go back to a gold standard because gold caused the Great Depression. And gold did not cause the Great Depression. <laughs> Discretionary monetary policy. So, you know, I bought a, uh, I have a copy of my book, of course, so I brought another book with me. This is, uh, it's called The Great Depression. You know, viewers probably can't see the, the author. It's a guy named Ben S. Bernanke. Uh, and uh, actually, I'll, I'll just hold up for the camera. The chairman was kind enough to autograph my copy, but I had the occasion. See, you and I are getting along with these guys now. Absolutely. I had we're, dinner we're, with Larry Summers the other night. We're, we're buds. So <laughs> I, 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 on a serious note, I spoke to uh, the chairman about this because I read, there's this notion out there, it comes from Barry Ike and Green and Bernanke and others who say, you know, gold, uh, gold caused the Great Depression. If we hadn't been on the gold standard, we could have got out of the Great Depression. That's why we can't go back to a gold standard because if we ever have another Great Depression, gold will tie our hands, et cetera. But Bernanke's own research, and that's why I brought it up with him, says that at no time during the Great Depression did gold act as a constraint on money supply. The law at the time, the money supply was not allowed to be more than 250% of gold at the market. $20.67 an ounce. So however much gold the Treasury yep. had, times tw or the Fed, 20.67 uh, an ounce, that was the limit of the money supply. It could be, sorry, it could be two and a half times that. At no time was the money supply more than 100% of the gold. In other words, the Fed had the discretion to go up another 150% and never did. So gold never acted as a constraint on the money supply during the Great Depression. Um, the Fed acted as a constraint on the money yeah. supply. So I said to uh, the chairman, I said, you know, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I said, I've read your research and it looks like gold was not a constraint on the money supply in the Great Depression. Do I have that right? And he said, yes, you do. So in other words, here's Bernanke saying that's a canard, that they, it, was, it was failed discretionary monetary policy, not gold, 
It was a failure by Winston right. Churchill to listen to Keynes, not gold, yes. that did cause the Great Depression, mm -hmm. but gold has got the blame. And I think someone like... Uh, well, because gold can't argue back. Gold can't argue back. That's and exactly right. And you know what? Right. All of these people, and you know, this fully loaded, they fundamentally believe, ideologically believe, that without them, we're doomed. Right. And that is not, I mean, gold can't answer the bell on that. You have legions of economists and failed journalists who have bought into this over the history of time. Right. And, and so Bernanke and Krugman actually get it. They're, they're smart enough to understand what we're talking about. Yeah. And they would say, yeah, Jim, you're right. Gold didn't act as a constraint. But, you know, but the law was 250%. What if we'd wanted to do 500%? Oh, exactly. You know, it could, they could have always done it more. It could theoretically have been a constraint, and that's why we don't yeah. like it. So that's an honest answer from the likes of Krugman or Bernanke. My problem is the people who don't do the research, the people who don't understand the history, who just repeat the, the meme of, you know, gold caused the Oh, that's, so, that's, so, and that's so much easier. Right. But that's what you hear on television. That's what you hear from journalists. That's what you hear from bloggers. And that, unfortunately, is what a lot of investors, including a lot of very sophisticated sophisticated investors right. believe, and it's just not true. So I, I had to just demolish these arguments I mean, the one by the, one. The reality is that, just like anything else, if you buy it low and you own it when it's on its way up, you'll right. be quite happy. Right. And the reality is that, well, what is gold's per performance since the, what we'd argue was the demographic cycle peak of U.S. demand in the year 2000? What is the return of gold versus the S&P 500 since that demand cycle peak? Well, it's not even close. I mean, since, uh, it's 600 percent. I mean, right. uh, it's, uh, you know, I actually, I actually, before I came on the set, uh, Keith, I, um, I looked at my, uh, you know, my iPhone and I got a report and it was that there was a report from an analyst at Oppenheimer. I'm sure I don't know him personally. I'm sure he's a good guy. And he said, uh, he's, he did the tech, he's recommending selling gold, gold's out of steam. And his technical analysis went back and looked at 1999. And I don't know what he was looking at in 1999, <laughs> but he said, you know, gold uh, traced this pattern and then it backed off. So I see the pattern again. So sell your gold today because it's going to back off. I said, are you kidding me? 1999, gold was $200 an ounce. I don't know what it did technically over some three month stretch that this technical analyst might be looking at. I do know. Yeah. that there was no better time in the last 35 years, or last 30 years, to buy gold than 1999. Absolutely. And so, yeah. so I said, okay, the guys- Guys, throw up a chart, a chart on, on page three, the historical price of, uh, of gold, what it did after 1999. Yeah. And people can see, and there is an envy to that. Do not, like, again, uh, well, yeah, I mean, people true. that miss this, missed a mother of a breakout. Right. They also missed the demographic peak in U.S. demand, right. which was in conjunction with that. Baby boomers peaked spending were in the 1990s. Many, 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 huge amounts of people. Right. <laughs> you know, they, 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 huge amounts of economists linked themselves to 1990s models. Yes, and they just completely missed that central planners would try to offset demand with devaluation of dollars. Right. And that gave birth to one mother of a long-term gold bull. If you bought it in, 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 in 2011, okay, fair enough, you're, yeah. you look like an idiot. Right. But if you bought it, in, in when I bought it in 2003, I mean, I still didn't even buy it. I, I bought it after it had its first part of the move. Correct. I mean, go back to that, that chart. So, so here's this prominent um, analyst from Oppenheimer saying he's looking at charts of 1999 and it's telling him to sell gold. Are you kidding me? I mean, the chart you just showed you, there was no better time to buy. There was no better. So I just, I just roll my eyes. I don't, you know, again, there's the chart. This <laughs> guy's saying, so 1999 tells me you should sell your gold. Out. I don't know where it comes from. No, this is what I have a harder yeah. and harder time, admittedly, going on broadcast TV because I can't actually call people out on complete nonsense, right. like statements like that. Yeah. It's like if we're just going to lie to each other, then let's just smile. Right, okay. You know, I got <laughs> fake teeth, and, you know, yeah. it's... It's fine. Yeah. Um, let's take some questions. Like there's, sure. um, th I'm going to give you a. Very, there's a ton of. Thank you very much for the questions. By the way, I have them all rolling live here. Um, this is a real simple one. It's one I ask myself this a fair amount, uh, given what happened in late 08 to gold. And again, this is a very short term, mm -hmm. uh, I think, view there. If you were to look at the window, but why own gold in a deflationary cycle? Well, there was the longest period of sustained deflation in American history was 1929 to 1933. In that period, gold went up 75 percent. And it was the only thing that went up. Why did it go up? The government made it go up because they were so fearful of deflation. They said, we have to inflate. We have to get some inflation. It's a massive price inflation. Right. That's, That's how they so did it. The government took the price of gold from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce, which is you know, 15 divided by a 75% increase. Government takes gold from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce, not to reward gold holders. In fact, 
FDR confiscated all the gold first. The, the Treasury profited. <laughs> yeah, they now, made what, the money. Now what he did, he confiscated the gold at 20 bucks, raised the price to 35, and then kept the profit. That, by the way, do you know that, that profit, that delta, uh, that FDR uh, from the confiscation, that was the financing for the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which is the Treasury slush fund, which by law is completely unaccountable to Congress. And Bob Rubin used it in 1994 to bail out Mexico during the peso crisis. So that Lovely. the peso crisis was bail out which the Congress, refu <laughs> Congress refused to authorize it. Rubin said, who cares, I'll do it anyway. And I'll use my slush fund, which was the profit the government took from confiscating gold. But my point is, gold went up 75% in the greatest deflation in American history. Best performing stock on the New York Stock Exchange during the Great Depression, homestake mining, gold miner. Mm -hmm. In other words, they, they knew that they had to get out of the deflationary uh, cycle, which you know, is psychological, recursive, feeds on itself. We all know Irving Fisher's debt deflation cycle of, uh, of depression, or uh, theory of depressions. Well, one of the ways you do it is you, ra you, you raise the price of gold, which is just devaluing the dollar. Exactly. I mean, when you take the price of gold up 75%, what you're really doing is devaluing the dollar mm -hmm. 75%. Guess what happened next? The stock market took off. The corn went up. Yeah, wheat. Exactly. You know, the, and that's what FDR wanted. He didn't want gold to go up. And he, this is exactly what Bernanke as, did. As Bernanke understood this full well. I Correct. think it's like beyond... I mean, at bare minimum, it's disingenuous because he's a, he's a thoughtful and intellectual guy. Correct. I mean, if the team, if our team could throw up slide seventy one in our current macro deck, we just show the last forty years of the U.S. dollar. What we should be really be looking at is the dollar since nineteen thirteen. Right. But uh, you know that the, the the reality is that if you didn't know that the dollar hit a post Nixon low or post nineteen seventy four low, when gold hit its peak right. in two thousand eleven. You're deaf, dumb, and stupid. I mean, this, is, this is a very obvious, very obvious relationship, and Bernanke right. knew that very well, and that not only would gold go up, but everything that's priced in dollars would go Correct. up. And so did Greenspan, by the way. Greenspan in uh, oh, I mean, you know, uh, no, oh one. It, we, so we had 9-11, we had a fairly mild recession around the time, but they came pretty close together. And Greenspan was scared to death of deflation in 2002. Oh, yeah? And the criticism, he kept rates too low, too long, which he did. He fed the housing bubble, which he did. You say, well, why did he do that? Was he stupid? No, he's not stupid. He, <laughs> he, he did it because he was more worried about deflation Absolutely. than he was about asset bubbles. Yep. And they were perfectly happy for gold to go up because, again, the same thing as FDR. It creates this psychology. Right. It changes inflationary expectations. So I actually um, can see the Fed uh, liking a rising price of gold because what's the Fed's biggest problem right now? deflationary expectations. Absolutely. They have to flip that to inflationary That's a great expectations. Point. How do you do it? Get the price of gold to go up and people say, oh my goodness, here comes the inflation. Well, why don't you just go buy some gold? <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is a comment from David. I constantly hear about gold as an insurance of the fear trade. Can you elaborate on gold as money or gold versus the fiat trade? Well, gold as money is, is the gold versus the fiat trade, but just to turn to the insurance aspect of it for a second. So, um, I recommend about 10% of your investable assets, and yep. for an individual, I say don't count your home equity and your business, that's you know, your shelter and your livelihood. Put that to one side. Everything else is your investable assets. For an institution, it's just whatever your portfolio is. I recommend 10%. By the way, the average institutional portfolio uh, is about 1.5% gold, yep. and that's not evenly distributed. Most portfolios have zero, and then there's like Kyle Bass in University of Texas, I think he's, yep. he's above average, but it's about 1.5%. If institutions just went from 1.5% to 3 or 4%, forget 10%. I mean, there's not enough gold in the world at anywhere <laughs> near these prices to fill that demand. So it wouldn't take much of an interest by institutions in gold to send the price skyrocketing, and that's just normal supply and demand. Um, but that's, that's an insurance component. So do you uh, have fire insurance on your house? Of course you do. Do you want your house to burn down? Of course not, heaven forbid. But if it does burn down, you're really glad you got the insurance. And when you write a check to the insurance company to pay for your fire insurance, do you think you're wasting your money? No, that's like, you're happy to yeah. send that check out. So that's one thing that gold can do in a portfolio. If, if it's all good and everything else is going to the moon and gold's mm -hmm. kind of sitting there not doing very much, um, you're not gonna get hurt. But if this collapses, which I expect it will, and this skyrockets, you'll be glad you had this component. Mm -hmm. By the way, the guys who are doing this are, are doing this are the Chinese. The Chinese it used to be four trillion, now it's three trillion. They have three trillion dollars approximately of, of reserves. About two trillion of those are US dollar denominated, mostly not exclusively US treasuries. Um, the, the dollar, everyone says, you know, China wants to destroy the dollar. It's nonsense. The, the dollar has no greater friend than China. <laughs> if you had two trillion, it's like the old joke, if I, the banker joke, if I owe you a million, I have a problem, but if I owe you a billion, you have a problem. We owe the Chinese two trillion, they have a problem. They're scared to death that we're going to inflate the currency yeah. and say, hey, here's the two trillion we owe you, good luck buying a loaf of bread. 
they're right to be scared because that's that's what yeah. we do. That's what America has always done, right? So so what are they doing? They say, why don't you dump your treasuries? They can't dump the treasuries. The treasury market is deep and liquid. It's not that deep and it's not that liquid. In fact, it's getting less liquid by the day. And if they really did something malicious in that market, the president could stop them with one phone call. He has emergency powers to freeze their account. So what the Chinese are doing instead is they're acquiring gold. Now, when I say acquiring gold, we're talking thousands of tons. Now, no one knows the exact number because they lie about it, but the best estimate based <laughs> on mining output, Hong Kong imports, seven years in a row, et cetera, there is some good data out there. They probably have four to 5,000 tons. They're trying to get to 8,000 tons, so they equal the United States. By the way, just having this conversation ought to clue people into the fact that we're still on the gold standard. Mm -hmm. It's a shadow gold standard. Nobody wants to talk about it. Why does the IMF still have 3,000 tons of gold? Why does Germany have 3,000 tons of gold? Why does the United States have 8,000 tons of gold? Why is China trying to acquire 8,000 tons of gold if gold's irrelevant? Yeah. So that, well, historically, you know, he, uh, that country, which has aggregated the most gold, particularly post-war, has it, had the most it, economic power worldwide. I mean, it's, it's a very correct. consistent reality that the U.S. took from the British, I mean, and, and that I'm assuming that the Germans and the Chinese wanted to take back. Right, and there was a stealth <laughs> uh, flanking maneuver on that. You're exactly right, Keith. And the U.S. was, uh, was uh, top dog. We've had 8,000 tons since, since 1980. By the way, there's a whole chapter in my book about why 8,000 tons? So it's just a clear little entry. I haven't read that we'll, yet. We'll get to that You part. got me too excited about the There's, uh, there's a the reason why. The, the, the United States uh, lost, um, in 1950 we had 12,000 tons. In 1970 we had 9,000 tons approximately. We lost those 11,000 tons the old-fashioned way by running trade deficits with our partners who very happily cashed in dollars and got gold. Mm -hmm. It was at that point there was a run on Fort Knox. Nixon closed the gold when he said we're keeping the gold. But we still had 9,000 tons. Between 1971 and 1980, we sold 1,000 tons. I would say dumped 1,000 tons, twisted the IMF's arm to dump 700 tons. So we dumped 1,700 tons of gold under really, really Ford and Carter administrations to suppress the price of gold. It failed. Inflation ran away. Gold went yep. from $35 an ounce to $800 an ounce. But when we got to 8,000 tons, we stopped. The United States has not sold any gold since 1980. Why is that? Well, there, there's a reason why they can't go. There's a hard floor there mm -hmm. having to do with the Fed balance sheet. So don't, don't tell me we're not on the gold standard. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Now, um, but, uh, but just kind of coming back to these, um, and then what we did, we got, the, we got the English to sell, the British to sell gold. We got the Swiss to sell gold. Poor Canadians, they cashed out their gold the other day. They're, they're, they're done. Um, <laughs> so, no, they did. No, they went to zero. They went to zero. We were never in the game. They had three tons, and they yeah. made maple leaves and said, that was have it. a nice life. So they're, they're done. Uh, but we're getting everyone else to sell their gold. But coming back to the Chinese, so why are the Chinese acquiring the gold? They're, it's a hedge position, right? Hedge, yeah. hedge, hedge. So, so they hope, they actually don't want to make money on the gold. They hope the treasuries are money good. But if we inflate the currency and the value of those treasuries goes down, the value of the gold is going exactly. to go up. So it's a perfectly hedged position. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense. I've spoken to IMF officials about this. They yeah. said, yeah, that's what they're doing. Um, well, I'm like, well, if it's good enough for the Chinese, it's good enough for me. <laughs> I like that, too. Um, I guess, do you have time for a couple more questions? I do, sure. or, um, you know, gold, gold bulls, savers, and debt-free individuals seem to have targets drawn on their backs by the government. Should they just lever up and enjoy the madness or stand pat because our bull run's about to come? Uh, I, I don't recommend a lot of leverage in gold because gold's pretty volatile as it yeah. is. You don't need to put volatility on top of volatility. And gold, in my mind, it's not that gold's volatile, it's that the dollar's volatile. I think, I think this meant should we just lever up, buy stocks, and get out of this stuff because you know, we have targets on our back. Oh, buy, no. Uh, <laughs> no. No, just, just you got a target on your back, get a Kevlar vest is my, uh, look. Uh, well, that's I, a real, I mean, re people really do think that Hillary can hire Summers and Summers will take over from Janet and well, Summers all will. All the more reason to get your gold now. I yeah, mean, so you get your gold now. Yeah, I mean, look, the analysis yeah. that gold's going to 10,000 is very straightforward. It's all in the book. Um, but my point, because I get these people say, well, Jim, would you please call me up at 3 o'clock the day before <laughs> it breaks out, and then I'll sell my stocks and get gold. And I say, look, I will tell you with 100% certainty this is going to happen. I will also tell you I won't know the day. So <laughs> what are you waiting for? The, 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 the problem, here's the, here's the problem, Keith, on a serious note. When that happens, when gold breaks out, you're not going to be able to get it. Exactly. The dealers are going to be, because there's a limit on the yeah. physical, right? You can create some open interest on futures, yeah. but, but they're going to start shutting down the futures exchange, as they did with the Hunt Brothers in 1980 with the silver. 
Uh, these unallocated floors that you buy from uh, J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs in London. Yeah. You, ever, you ever read the contract? I'm actually a geek. I've read the contracts. So, so I call up J.P. Morgan London and say, I want to buy a ton of gold. They say, okay, here's the contract. You sign it. Boom. You own the ton of gold. You don't. It's called unallocated. Unallocated is a euphemism for no gold. In other words, they have a ton. They sell 100, 100 tons yep. to people on an unallocated basis, and they all think they own gold. So if everyone showed up for their gold, so excuse me, I'd like to take delivery, yep. please. 99 of those people are not going to get their exactly. gold. One person's going to get the gold. That's going to be a yep. buying panic. The price is going to surge. But my point is, you're not going to be able to get it. Right. So what are you waiting for? Well, that's what a ton of these questions, I mean, there's, by the way, there are more questions here than there is return year to date in gold, which has been a great year for gold. <laughs> um, but if you look, I mean, a lot of these questions have to do with should I own physical, what are the risks of owning on the ETFs or the miners? I mean, you, you really do believe, and, and I was just in Greenwich on Sunday night with my wife, we were at a, people would know who he is, he's a major uh, yeah. money manager, and he was, like, he was snickering in between, um, we were basically having cocktails and the wives were talking, and he, he, he said, come to my office, and he was showing me almost like the Easter Bunny, stacks right. of physical gold that he had hidden behind books, and this guy, I mean, I'm telling you, He's, he's maybe your age. He is very convinced that owning physical is going to be you know, the, the thing that everybody in Greenwich, well, Connecticut brags about. I agree with that completely, and I'm not going to mention names. Uh, there's no reason to, but I know billionaires. I know prominent hedge fund individuals. I don't know one of them who doesn't have physical gold. Now, they won't talk about it because they're out there buying and selling mm -hmm. stocks all day. Uh, they've got home vaults, you know, et cetera. The answer is I do recommend physical uh, for the reason I mentioned, which is, the um, so take Comex for example, you know. So I own gold futures on Comex or whatever. If everyone says, well, if if all the longs demanded delivery, it would bust the warehouse. There's not enough gold, yeah. in the, and there isn't. There isn't close to enough gold close. in the Comex warehouse, right? But what would the exchange do? The exchange, the governing board would have a meeting. They would say, we're ordering what's called trade for liquidation only. Trade for liquidation means you can roll your contract, or you can also, like if you're long, you can sell, oh, or you can roll to a calendar spread, but you cannot take physical delivery. And they say, read the rule book, because I, I have read them. Um, the, the exchange says, we are not a source of supply. The only reason they allow physical delivery at all is to kind of keep the, the basis uh, honest, mm -hmm. but if, if enough people ask for physical gold, they'll say you can't have it, right? So that's not going to get you any physical gold. Now that's what they will do, they'll say trade for liquidation only, or they'll shut down the contract. They'll send you uh, a check for the close of business yesterday. They won't steal your money. They'll say here's your check, COB, <laughs> yesterday. But meanwhile, today the gold's up $500 an ounce. You're out of the game because we closed out your contract. And they can do that. This is all in the rule books. Same thing with these unallocated gold contracts. They have force majeure. Uh, they have early termination. They have material adverse change clauses. All the legal stuff that no one ever bothers to read. You know too much about this. Well, I'm a, I'm a lawyer in addition to <laughs> everything else. For those of you that didn't know, the lawyer at long-term capital management, correct? Yes, we did. Uh, you did know, that about. if you if you need a guy, you know, you're not going to be able to get Jim, unfortunately. But the reality is that you have read the fine print, and you know, forget how well versed you are in the history of it all. And, and not just gold, obviously, in the entire, you, you are the author of the currency Futures, war. Futures, I mean, this is, this is, you know, these contracts are a very important part of differentiating between what you think you own and what you actually own. It's, Correct. Is, is this, I mean, um, here's another question on that same, on that same, um, you know, because people want to know, like, if you're, if you had to start today if, and you had to buy a gold coin or you had to right. buy a stack of them or you had to buy bars, whatever you could afford, you know, how would you start doing that, and is there a cheapest way to do it without like recommending some broker? Right. There, there are, de yeah, depending on your, your price point, et cetera, uh, I recommend American Gold Eagles uh, from the U.S. Mint. This is a U.S. Mint coin. It says, in God we trust. Mm -hmm. So you can rely on the, uh, you know, the purity and the quality of it. It's a beautiful coin, by the way. Better than that Canadian crap. You're well, I, I don't, I don't want to. I've got, I got, <laughs> got family in Canada. I don't, I'm not a business. I love Canada. Uh, it's a pretty exotic country for, uh, for Americans. But, uh, gold uh, Eagles. Okay. American Gold Eagles. Now, for larger quantities, look, the new standard is uh, it's called four nines, which is 99.99% .99 pure, one kilo bar. So get one kilo bars from a, a well, you know, reputable uh, refiner, you know, it could be um, uh, Argo Horaeus, could be PAMP, uh, there, there are a number of them out yep. there, uh, et cetera. Now, the old standard, interestingly, was the 400 ounce bar, which was two or three nines. It was 99% pure, maybe 99.9% .9 pure. The new standard, which has been set by the Chinese, is four nines, 99.99% .99 pure, 
one kilo bar. That's two and, uh, two and a half pounds, or 2.2 pounds. Uh, that, that's a kilo. So um, for no large- No wonder these Chinese guys are just buying the living daylights out of this stuff. I mean, they know how the game ends. They did it with, exactly. they did it with Bordeaux wines. Right. They did it with anything that has a limited supply. My friend Goldfinger, is, he runs a refinery in Switzerland. But he, <laughs> well, he, that's very calm. He, uh, uh, he just got back from China as a prominent Swiss refinery executive. He took a tour of the gold refineries in China, saw more than most people. He said, completely state of the art. This, these are not like little people, you know, melding things and pouring no, it no, no, yeah, yeah. You know, it's Completely well state of the art, high energy input. Um, they're, they're refining their own gold because they have 450 tons a year of mining output. They're not letting that leave the country, so they're refining that in China. Now, interestingly, every refinery puts a stamp on it. So he sits there in Switzerland, he brings gold in, he brings these old 400 ounce bars scrap, which is, you know, necklaces and stuff, and then dore, which is 90, 80% gold from the miners. He refines it into four nines, one, one uh, kilo bar, sends it to China, right? Mm. So interesting. Now, these bars have dates on them. Really? He said, yeah. they, they're just like a dollar bill. You see, yeah. I've seen these bars, and they have, like, the, the refinery, they have an assayer stamp, they have a serial number, mm. unless you buy it from J.P. Morgan, then it's unallocated, and then they have a, they have a date on it, just like a dollar bill. Now. The, the vaults operate on a LIFO basis. You know, the last gold you put in is the first gold that comes out. Makes sense. Why go to the back of the warehouse when you can take the bar close to the door, right? He said he's seen bars from the 1980s. He said this tells him that these, these warehouses are being stripped, ah. that they're get, going to the back of the warehouse to get the 30-year-old, the bar that's been sitting there for 30 years. He said this is what's coming in the door. He said he has never seen a Chinese bar. So why doesn't a bar like that have, I mean, we, we got to stop at some point here yeah. because you got to go and... I could I could sit I could literally sit oh, here and fun. talk yeah, to you all day about this. I mean, because you're like an encyclopedia on this. But why doesn't a gold a vintage gold bar like my like I have a 2800 you know, bottle wine cellar? Yeah. I, I know that the ones with the certain dates are better than the ones are worth a lot more, and they keep getting right. worth a lot more. I mean, why don't vintage bars have a premium? Well, they're interesting, but I don't think they have any numismatic value. Look, gold is gold. The beauty of gold is that uh, you don't think they have any value. Like if, if I, the world's going to where the, you're going. And we go to Greenwich, Connecticut. You're telling me that the top ten guys and gals in Greenwich don't want to brag that they have the 1962 bar. Uh, Greenwich is a strange place. Maybe, maybe, they, <laughs> maybe they do. Maybe they want the bragging rights, and, and they're welcome to it. As far as I'm concerned, I'll take a four nines, you know, 2016, right. one kilo bar. To me, that's the best gold in the world. Interesting. This. So you're long-term bull, but you're not crazy, because you could have easily said, "Oh yeah, that's the next." I mean, no. I mean, I mean actually, when when I see these dealers uh, selling coins for. 200% markups for numismatic value. I took, never pay for numismatic. If you're a genuine coin collector and you got like a Byzantine coin or something, that's fine. But do not pay for numismatic value. Pay for just you know get get new uh, uh, get new gold. And I do um, yeah I do recommend that. That's the way to go. I like that. Yeah, thank you. Well, well thank you very much for uh, th this. I think can be the first of a lot of conversation on this topic. I hope so. Because again, I, I want everybody to buy this first of all. Um, one question that you had, by the way, was when does Jim's book go gold, where this is actually physical gold, the cover? <laughs> um, because I, I do think that it's something that you have to educate yourself on, and I'm quite happy that I had uh, the world's author developing the world's author on this. So we have a lot to talk about on that front, but again, thank you very, very much. It was our first time going live, so hopefully we didn't mess it up too, too much. <laughs> He's Jim Records. You can find him. It's at, J at James G Records. That's his Twitter handle. He's prolific, big time. He's huge. And I'm uh, at Keith McCullough. You can find me there. Thanks.